And welcome to the Health Research Report section of the Fit and Healthy Show this 19th of October 2012. Well, to start off, the first health report I'd like to go through is caffeine may block inflammation linked to mild cognitive impairment. This came out of the University of Illinois. What they discovered is this. Well, let's start back up a little bit. What they did was this. They gave caffeine to one group of mice and did not give caffeine to another group of mice to test the effects of what's called hypoxia. Now, what hypoxia is, obviously, depriving the brain of oxygen. So they're kind of like suffocating them, but not quite to the point of death. Yeah, this happens to mice a lot, but to the point of brain damage. And then what they noticed with the caffeine uh, ministered group was simply one interesting thing, that they regained the learning ability 33% faster than basically the group of mice which did not have any caffeine prior. Now what they discovered was along those lines, when you have a case of a hypoxia, the substance called, it's like a fuel, called adenosine, leaks from the cell membranes inside the brain. Now when the adenosine leaks, it can create a lot of inflammatory factors. What the caffeine did was it deactivated the adenosine that was outside the cells. So kind of like cleaning up a fuel spill, the fuel that went outside the fuel tank. By doing this, it reduced inflammation and allowed the brain to recover much faster. Something to think about possibly in sports, think about boxing or anything else where there's a chance of what we call hypoxia. And so caffeine, not so bad, especially when it comes to memory attainment and recovering from any sort of type of brain injury that results in hypoxia. And then another one comes out back to vitamin C. Now often, a lot of you that are new to this show realize a tremendous amount of benefit comes out in regards to vitamin C. But you just don't happen to hear about it a lot in the media. Why? Don't have a good answer for that. Uh, maybe a bunch of uh, newscasters were just uh, resentful they had to eat their veggies as a kid and somehow want to prove that vitamins don't do anything. Well, unfortunately, that's going to be a poor chase to follow. Well, what they came out with is in regards to vitamin C. And this was research released on the October 8th PLOS online, the Public Library of Science online. Obviously, what happens when you deprive the vitamin C below your maintenance levels, whatever that is, uh, you become to prone to scurvy and brittle bone. So what they want to do is they want to reverse that to see exactly what happened. Well, this is what they came up with. And this was done by the Mount Sinai School of Medicine, too. Just to give you an idea. What they discovered is when large doses of vitamin C were ingested, again, they did it on mice, uh, they actively stimulated the bone formation to protect the skeleton. Also, it did this by inducing what's called osteoblasts. You have osteoclasts and osteoblasts, or a premature bone cell, to differentiate into mature mineralizing specialty cells. So vitamin C does something as a signaling platform for the cells to build strong bones. Kind of like stem cells have to differentiate. It's blank. Well, vitamin C is a communicator, obviously, when it comes to the bone structure and producing new quality cells. Another reason to take your vitamin C. All right. Something you probably haven't heard about in the news either, but salivy. This is amazing. This one, basically, was regards to exercise. I want to see exactly who did the study here. It was done by the Anschluss Medical Campus in the University of Colorado. It's important that all studies be footnoted and you know this have the source information. Otherwise, people can tell you anything. If they sound confident, you believe it. But always look for the footnoted information. But back to this article. What they discovered was this. Two and a half minutes, just two and a half minutes of intense exercise anywhere during the day, most likely probably more towards the morning, but about anywhere during the day, resulted in additional 200 calories of metabolism, meaning you burnt an additional 200 calories of fuel the entire day. That was pretty amazing. We're just talking two and a half minutes minutes. What they would like to see, obviously, is them to get to 25 minutes. But they said this, a single session of sprint interval training increases total daily expenditure 
uh, basically, and they will discuss it in the Integrative Biology of Exercise 6 meeting on October 10th and 13th, which already happened at the Westminster Hotel. Apologize about that. I had to back up. But that's what they discovered. All right, now we're going to the next article. Obviously, I need more caffeine. Link between creativity and melt mental illness confirmed. This was interesting because they tried to relate the mental illness to certain branches of creativity with being an author, an artist, and yes, even a scientist. So, it's important because you have to look at the balance between treating the mental illness and what you may lose by treating the mental illness. Back to the research. What they said was this. And this was done in the Karolinska Institute. All right. They found that the people in creative professions are treated more often for melting illness than the general population. Therefore, they say a particularly salient connection between writing and schizophrenia, for example. Authors, they found, are more prone to schizophrenia. Last year, the team showed that artists and scientists were more common among families where bipolar and schizophrenia is present, compared to the population at large. The results confirmed that their previous studies in regards to certain illnesses, mental illnesses, such as bipolar, is more prevalent in the entire group of people with artistic or scientific professions. So, most of your scientists are very susceptible to being bipolar and or, at the same time, artists, and such as dancers, researchers, photographers, and authors. But authors, particularly, were more prone to schizophrenia and as opposed to other psychiatric diseases. Anxiety, depression, and authors, yes, substance abuse. In fact, they found that authors are more like 50% more likely to commit suicide than the general population. Kind of what you want to think about before choosing your career path. But, they also came out to this conclusion too. In that case, the doctor and patient, patient must come to an agreement on what is to be treated and at what cost. So, yeah, a person may be mentally ill in your idea of what mental illness is, but that mental illness could also be considered a gift. You have to look at the whole picture is what they're trying to say. Because someone does something you don't necessarily agree with the fine logical, doesn't mean it's something you should sort of press all the time. They said in psychiatry and medicine, generally there has to be a tradition to see the disease in black and white. Saying basically psychiatry usually sees you either sick or not sick. They don't look at the in-betweens of what it may be adding to or subtracting to. And to endeavor to treat the patient by removing everything regarding as morbid. So again, is the illness a gift or is the illness a curse? Really good study from the Karolinska Institute. Something to think about because we don't want everyone being the same. Otherwise, where's your scientists, artists, artists authors, dancers, etc., etc., etc.? And now, the last one. Carob. They found an interesting impact on carob. Did you know carob is antibacterial? It's kind of like caffeine, but a little different. Because carob doesn't carry, contain caffeine or theobromine, which they found also is aller dogs are very allergic to. They found that that carob has an incredible impact on fighting food poisoning from listeria. And this was printed in the Journal of Agricultural and Food Chemistry. So they said that they cite a need for new substances to combat listeria monocytogenes. Apologize about the pronunciation. Bacteria that cause food poisoning and outbreaks in dozens of states with at least three deaths this year so far. They said carob may be best known as a substitute for chocolate because it does not contain the caffeine of three beam, which makes chocolate toxic to dogs. Showing that carob leaves proved effective in inhibiting the growth of the Listeria bacteria in laboratory cultures. So if you're eating someplace, not quite certain about the food, just want to basically get some carob just to play it safe, it's not such a bad idea. So think about Listeria and carob. Something to add to your diet, especially when traveling and abroad and not eating things you're familiar with. Well, that ends this report, 19th of October, 2012. Any questions, don't hesitate to email me. And again, we're going to put more of the detailed stuff uh, in regards to corruption, pharmaceutical um, problems as far as research and so on and so forth on the www.engineeringevil.com site. 
But any questions, never hesitate to email. Thanks, this is Ralph Turchiano, signing off for today.